Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome to our last episode on slide rules. This is the last of our general introduction to the different types of slide rules if you want to select one for your own use. We're going over some of the specialty slide rules in this episode to include aviation and military slide rules. But I'd like to start off with this one right here. This is a Faber-Castell 283 and it is considered probably the best slide rule ever made as far as beauty of the slide rule itself and its accuracy. So let's cue up the music and get on with some slide rules. Now the 283 has a lot of the standard scales that we've seen on the engineering rules. It's got the A and the B scale. It's got a couple of folded scales. It of course has a C and a D scale and a CI scale. Now the trigonometric scales are a little bit different. We have the S and the ST scale, which is the sine and the small angle scale. The T scale or tangent scale is split into two different sections. And we have an additional scale down here called a P scale or a Pythagorean scale. Now the reason that we use the P scale, and it's a very handy feature to have, now say if we take an angle on the S scale of 10 degrees. Now in order to find the sine of 10 degrees, all we would do is read up to the C scale, and there it is. It's 0 0.173. However, to find the cosine, we would normally have to come all the way over here and as you can see, it would be very difficult for us to find the, the cosine of 10 degrees. Here's 20, here's 30, 10 would be about here, and as you see, this is very close to 1. But if we instead use the P scale, or the Pythagorean scale, all we have to do is leave it right on our 10 degrees, and then read straight down onto the P scale, and we will get a very accurate measurement of the cosine of that angle. And in this case, it's going to be 0.9952. So that's quite a few significant digits. The main advantage is the convenience. The, the cosine will be right under the sine. Now, another very interesting thing that you'll see on some of these more advanced scales is that you have marks on the cursor. I don't know if you can see these very well, but there's some marks. For example, here's a D mark. Now, as you recall, the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. So if we put a 2 under the D mark on the cursor, representing a circle of diameter 2 units, we can actually read right up on the A and the B scale, and we can directly read off the area of that circle, in this case, pi. Now, if we bring this out a little further, say to 6, here the radius would be 3, and once again, we read up to the A scale or the B scale, and we read off the area of that circle. And in this case, it's going to be 28.3. We can also read off direct conversions from kilowatts to horsepower as well. Now we also have a unique set of scales on the 283, and that's these W scales. We have W1, W1 prime, we have W2 and W2 prime. Now the purpose of this is very much like those cube root scales that we saw on the picket slide rule. This is a split scale. And when you use this particular scale, you turn this 10 inch slide rule into the accuracy of a 20 inch slide rule. Let me show you. Let's take the circumference of the earth and find the radius of the earth from that. Now the circumference of the earth is 24,901 miles. Here's the 2, here's the 2.5, this is 2.4, and this is 2.49. So that very accurately lets us mark that. Now what we can do is divide this in half, so we'll put the 2 directly over the 2.4901. Now by marking it here, we can then go to pi. And we'll do that on the W2 prime scale, which is directly above it, right up here. 
then all we have to do is move our cursor to the index, which is 1, and what do we get? 3,900 and just over 60 miles. Now this is an excellent time to talk about the accuracy of slide rules and how it's a function of the size of the slide rule. Now, for convenience, we use pocket slide rules such as this. They're generally either five or six inches long. A standard slide rule is 10 inches long. Now for greater accuracy, we can use a 20 inch slide rule. And this one's marked up pretty much as an engineering rule as well. Interestingly enough, it has a P scale on it, just like the Faber-Castell as well. You see these on European slide rules in both the Aristo Studio and the Faber-Castell or German slide rules. Okay, so I've done the calculations. So on the five inch slide rule, we're getting 3,950 miles. Now on the 10 inch slide rule, we're getting about 3,900, and I would say 40 miles. Looking at the W scales on the Faber-Castell 283, we're getting 3,500, 3,900, and about 70 miles. Looking at the same equation on the 20 inch slide rule, we get 3,500, 3,900, and 70 miles. And looking at it on the fuller calculator, we get 3,964 miles. Now let's compare this to a modern calculator. Now on the modern calculator, we take 24,901 miles, we divide it by two, and then we divide that by 3.14159, which is pi. And we get 3,963 miles. The fuller calculator was one mile off. Let's go over a couple of specialty slide rules. In aviation, we have something called an E6B flight computer. Now let's do a couple of calculations with the E6B flight computer. Right here, you'll notice that there is a large arrow here at the top that represents 60 minutes. If I put my fuel burn in for my aircraft is nine and a half gallons per hour, how long can I fly? Well, the fuel capacity of my aircraft is 48 gallons, and if you look down at about the 8 o'clock position, you're going to see 50, and right next to it, by coincidence, there's an arrow at about 48 gallons. So if you read straight underneath that arrow, you'll see that I have about five and a quarter hours worth of fuel on board if I take off with my tanks full. Now obviously, I can't fly five and a quarter hours and land on empty. Now under aviation requirements, I have to have enough fuel on board to not only reach my destination, but reach an alternative airport in case my destination airport is unavailable and land with either 30 or 60 minutes of fuel remaining. That allows me to calculate how long I can fly. So let's say that my duration of flight is going to be four hours. Now how far will I go in that four hours? Well, the speed of my aircraft is 145 knots. There I have my one hour arrow at 145 knots. It's a simple matter to go over to nine o'clock and see how far I can fly. And again, I can read out the distance on the outer ring and see that I can make just over 600 miles. But am I going to make 145 knots over the ground? Well, if there's zero wind, yeah, sure. But what if there's some wind? Okay, so this is the back side of the E6B flight computer. Okay, so here's the technique that we use to figure out what our ground speed will be by taking into account the winds aloft. Because as we're flying through the air, we're not only flying through the air, we're going with the wind. So what we'll do is we'll put the dot right in the center at 100 knots. And then what we're going to do is we're going to determine what direction the wind is coming from, say 290 degrees. Then we need to put in the wind speed, say the wind is whipping along at about 20 knots. 
Now what we do is we rotate this ring to our direction of flight. Okay, we're in the home stretch now. Say uh, my airspeed is 145 knots. Well, now what I have to do is I have to take that dot and put it on 145 knots. This now gives me two pieces of information. First of all, if you look over there at the center, you'll see that my actual speed across the ground is going to be about 138 knots, not 145 knots. And you'll also see that in order to maintain a northerly course, I'm actually going to have to steer a little bit west. How much? Looks like eight degrees. So that's how you do wind calculations on an E6B flight computer. Here's another example of an aviation slide rule. This is a landing distance calculator. So what you do is you basically take into account the normal landing roll of your aircraft on a paved runway. Is there a density or pressure altitude that's abnormal? Is the runway wet? Is it sod rather than concrete? You can, you can do all of these things here. You can find your takeoff distance and more importantly, your landing distance. Takeoffs are optional, landings are mandatory. Now, as you can tell, this thing's green. What's that mean to you? This is from 1946. It's not a true slide rule because there's no slide on it, but there is this plate that has a variety of um, graduations on it and it's got a movable slide. You know, it gives you the relationship between a couple of numbers. This is an M23 graphical firing table. Now, this is used to determine the elevation of the tube when you are firing a 105 millimeter howitzer or 155 millimeter howitzer based on the type of projectile and the number of powder bags that you're using. Now, this will take into account the factors that you need to use for curvature of the earth, for Coriolis, and it'll tell you exactly where you have to aim that tube in order to have a chance of getting in the same postal zone as the target that you're trying to hit. That's to get the first shot and then you walk it into the target and do the fine tuning under, under direct observation over the horizon. Well guys, there's an introduction to some more advanced and specialty slide rules. I hope that you enjoyed it and there are actually going to be specific tutorials on a couple of these like the E6B. So in the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you again for stopping by, and I do appreciate your support of this channel. Thank you again to all the Patreons, the members, and the subscribers. Remember to hit that like and subscribe on your way out if you haven't already done so, and I'll see you again soon.